goes so long. It's, it's better we can finish faster this way, though. Yeah, because now we can just go right into it. So. Did I right, say last name right? Or? Yeah, you nailed it. Okay. So this <laughs> like, is your segment coming up. Uh oh. You know, so he's gonna ask you questions, and then I'll probably just throw in some different stuff that I think. And so this will be mainly yours, and we may even run this. You know, probably run it into two. Yeah. And so any stories that you think, we'll just you know just say it, and we'll just adjust to it and make it happen. And um, you know, just uh, be you and have fun, and you know, it's cool that it's not live. Yeah. So if we do make any mistakes, <laughs> like even with, I'm like, I'm like. Yeah, Melanie's looking at me like, yeah, tonight. Night, I'm like, well, night, let's night, see. Night, like, Hall of Fame. I'm like, it is Monday, guys. Remember that. Oh, that's right. <laughs> like, yeah, he's like, that. Well, time. we're so used to doing it on Wednesday. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah it can be perfect, right. so. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, All right. some stuff there. Welcome back, San Diego. My name is Kyle Whistle. You're listening to Whistle Wednesdays here on KCDQ 1170. If you ever want to connect with myself or any of the guests we have on the show, you can always reach out to us via text message, 619-663-7355, 619-663-7355. And before the break, we were talking about one of my idols in the real estate industry, Donald Trump. And apparently Donald Trump, from what I read, has filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy four times now in his career. And how is somebody that's filed bankruptcy four times, how is that guy back on top of the world again? So we brought in a guest today, Lawrence Mudgett with Safer Law. I want to talk to you a little bit about how this bankruptcy thing works. So what is a Chapter 11 bankruptcy that, you know, that Donald Trump has filed? Well, Chapter 11 bankruptcy is for someone like Donald Trump. It's, it's for businesses and uh, individuals who have a great deal of assets and, and, and personal wealth to manage. It's essentially a, a reorganization. My okay. work uh, consists mainly of Chapter 7 and Chapter 13 bankruptcies, which deal more on, on an individual level with more everyday type consumers. Gotcha. So I know that you and I met, I think it was 2010 when we first connected with each other and we were helping a client out at that time that was going through a bankruptcy. And so yeah, Chapter 7, Chapter 13, that's much more along the lines of what we're encountering in the real estate business. So with Chapter 11 being more of a business reorganization kind of thing, what about Chapter 7 and 13? What are, what's the difference between the two of those? Sure, great question. A uh, Chapter 7 bankruptcy is a liquidation. Essentially, your debts get set to zero. Your credit report will note that you no longer owe this money anymore. You have no legal obligation to pay it. Whereas a Chapter 13 is a repayment plan. So the court, com you complete what's called the means test, which takes into account your income, certain deductions, and uh, they figure out a certain number you pay, and that's distributed by the trustee to your creditors who receive pennies on the dollar. Lawrence, let me ask you a question. How does someone decide on, on a 7 or 13? Is that something them and their attorney as you decide, or is that something the court decides? Great question. So most, of, most people want to do a 7 because that's your liquidation, you're out of the debt, as opposed to paying something towards it over time. What decides it is how much money you make. If you make too much money to qualify for a Chapter 7, then you'll end up in a 13. And what's but, that number? Well, it depends based on your household size. For an individual of one, I believe the cutout is uh, $48,009. Um, it, it changes every year with the, yeah. with the census data. Um, they update it regularly. And then, you know, each additional person you have in your house, it goes up from that point. Gotcha. Yeah, because it would seem like everybody might as well do a seven if you can. So they actually have put safeguards in place to stop people from taking advantage of that. Exactly, and that's the whole point for bankruptcy. You know, the stated purpose in the code is to give honest individuals a fresh start. Okay. So if somebody, you know, is running into some financial burden, I mean, what are, and you meet with them, how is that conversation going to go, helping determine where they're at? First off, is bankruptcy an option and in, in their best interest? And then second, once they determine if it is in their best interest, how they go down either the 7 or the 13 route? Sure. So... Usually, you know, the average call, somebody has questions about bankruptcy, maybe they've heard about it but don't exactly know what it is. Um, we kind of sit down. The first thing I always do is pull the credit report. Very easy to get. So it sounds like he's pre-qualified. Pre <laughs> right? so this is yeah, exactly what like I do. Lines. So this is exactly what I do. People don't know what their credit is like, so mm -hmm. we pull their credit. We talk about debt-to-income ratios, look at their debt. So that sounds like the same thing you're doing. Definitely. All right, so go on. So we, we take a look and uh, considering what their income is, what I always say, there's no sense spending good money chasing bad. 
So the debts you have, maybe collection accounts, credit cards, medical bills, whatever's on there. Uh, maybe there's a foreclosed property, an old second mortgage or something that's sticking around. You know, um, do you want to discharge this and get out from under it? Do you think that if you maybe budgeted better, you could pay for it? You know, that, that's kind of the initial analysis. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, so some of the things that a lot of our clients need to know is, is it better to do a short sale foreclosure? Is it better to have a bankruptcy? And again, it's different for each person. Sure. And in general, um, I know that when clients come to you, they don't always get a bankruptcy, right? Because you're looking at their overall situation. And so maybe on a percentage, just ask, and I'm asking you, let's say if you met with 20 clients this past month, how many would you actually recommend bankruptcy versus maybe some other solution? Well, again, like you said, it's really an individual basis. Um, it would be hard to just put a percentage on it, but I'd say a good percentage of people, once they've come to that point, and I think oftentimes what you see a lot is people kind of ignore uh, collections actions or lawsuits or things, and, and, and they have a way of piling on until there's a wage garnishment in place. You've got a bank account levy, you know, so something you want to do. Is usually when people are finally coming into you, so most people yeah. just kind of like, they just start throwing the mail away. They don't want to look at anything anymore, and they just kind of it's close amazing. their eyes and hope that the problem goes away. But then, yeah, once they start tapping your bank account or your paycheck, that, so that's the time when a lot of people tend to come in. Right. That, that's when it gets real. Up until then, it's just a piece of paper or something in the mail. It doesn't affect them personally. And then, yeah, you know, your, your paycheck's 25% light. Right. You, and you then, might be then you're like, well, I need, yeah, yeah, then you're starting to concern. So let me ask you this. When's it too early? or too late to start talking to a, a, a bankruptcy attorney, somebody like yourself, Lawrence, when's a good time? So, you know, when they start having issues, again, you know, way before their garnishment, I think they should be probably talking to somebody like yourself. I, I definitely agree. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people I've, I've had a sit down with and then they, oh, you know, we're going to tough it out. And then they're calling me a year later and they say, oh, you know, I, I try to keep the ship afloat and it's just like, well, if we'd have done this a year ago, you'd be that much closer to being out of the process, having it off your credit and, and rebuilding yourself financially. So I think if, you know, you've got more credit card debt than you can ever pay, if you've got judgments out there, there's collections, actions, any of that kind of stuff's going on, it definitely pays to talk to a qualified professional, and an attorney who knows the bankruptcy law and will give you an honest assessment of, um, so it's really never too early, is what you're saying. I mean, if you, it's kind of, kind of like a financial planner. I mean, if they look at it, they need to be thinking about it. If they really truly think, hey, I might have more debt than I can really afford, you know, I can't make my monthly obligations, that's probably the time that, hey, I should be at least thinking about texting Kyle at 619-663-7355, right, and getting Lawrence's number. So if you're out there and you're not making your bills on time, I think you know, my professional opinion, 24 years of doing real estate financing, that's the time you need to reach out to professionals, somebody like Lawrence. So let's be thinking about that because I know from a, from a financing end, um, I've had a lot of clients claim bankruptcy and in two years with VA, they're getting back on the market, buying a house. Three years with FHA, you're back on the market, buying a house. In Fannie, it's four years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not a bad thing. And I know I mentioned to you, we were out in the studios waiting, um, you know, my grandma was raised in the 30s, 40s, and you know, uh, in the 50s when she got married. And back then, if you claimed bankruptcy, you were no longer friends in her inner circle. And that's kind of how she raised me. Um, and so I've been very you know, difficult on that. But it's now way more accepted. And there's been times in my life I should have claimed bankruptcy. I'd have been better off. Uh, you know, I'd be $100,000 more in the bank. Sorry, hon. Um, but I, the good news is I did pay everybody back. Um, because I knew I had the ability to make the money. I just wasn't making it at the time, um, you know, dealt with the situation I had to deal with. But uh, I knew I could pay it back. And like my wife said, she goes, maybe you wouldn't make as much, Jason, had you done the bankruptcy. So it's different for everybody. Sure. Well, it sounds like you were one of the lucky ones um, to, to come through that. And, and like we said in the, in the hall earlier, you know, there's definitely that stigma. Um, but really, it's nothing to be ashamed about. Sometimes we get overextended, things happen, markets, you know, fall apart. Uh, these, these things uh, can happen to honest people, and this system is there for you to get that financial fresh start. I mean, I have clients with FICOs in the uh, mid-7s, a year removed, right. who now have awesome. options 
when they didn't. So definitely, I, I think wherever you are in the process, it at least pays to talking to somebody who knows so you can at least conceptually understand what's in a bankruptcy, what's possibly out there for you, and whether or not it's, it's the right fit. Okay, let me ask you, Kyle, on, on, on bankruptcy. I know you did a lot of short sales when, the, when there was a bunch out there. And sometimes, all of a sudden, the client filed bankruptcy. So how did that change that real estate event? When they would file bankruptcy yeah. during the short sale? Yeah. Well, that's how Lawrence and I met each other. So we had a client who was actually going through the short sale process. And, you know, it can become a big burden in your life when you've got a short sale going, you've got all these other debts piling up. And they decided to, without telling us anything, just go down to the courthouse and file the bankruptcy. And unfortunately, once the bankruptcy gets filed, you can't really have a real estate transaction occur while you're going through a bankruptcy unless, uh, I believe it's a motion for relief from stay, is that the uh, proper yeah, term? Yeah, that's, that's good, uh, you got the lingo. Good memory, you got good memory. So, so, yeah, I mean, that was how Lawrence and I actually connected the very first time around was he was, we basically had a mutual client and he helped them with the uh, bankruptcy, but he was able to get the motion for relief from stay, which allowed the property to close escrow even during the bankruptcy process. So talk about that a little bit. Sure. More. So what you brought up was, is probably the biggest issue I see in bankruptcy on a day-to-day -day basis are issues with the automatic stay. Once an individual files bankruptcy, whether it's a 7, a 13, or an 11, um, what, what's known as the automatic stay goes into place and basically everything else is stopped. Collections, actions, lawsuits, foreclosures, sales transactions, collection calls, none of that can go on anymore. So you can see how if there's a sale pending, a short sale pending, as in the case we were on together, um, that creates potential issues. A lot of times what I'll do is get an order relieving stay from the bankruptcy court so that sale can go through or maybe there's a lawsuit pending or whatever the circumstances dictate. Um, I think in our case actually uh, the trustee just release the property from the um, bankruptcy estate. A lot of times the trustees are, are happy to do a short sale. Just right. Because it's one less debt, it. right? So exactly. they, what I was told is they consider something, they'll look at it and figure out if it's an asset or a non-asset. And so in a house, which is a short sale, obviously upside down, a lot of times they'll consider that a non-asset and allow the short sale to happen. Exactly. Because it's one, it's usually the biggest part of the bankruptcy case that's happening is that that property so if they can get that property out of it I would assume it makes the rest of the bankruptcy a little bit easier exactly you know and the trustees job I think what they're charged with is to try to find fraud you know when you file you make disclosures in your statements and schedules about what you owe what you're making what you own and uh, they're just kind of screening to see hey did the lawyer do his due diligence maybe you know does this person have some money in the Cayman Islands or something like that and, and just like you said, if there's a, a short sale and you've got an over-encumbered property and we can show, hey, um, it's worth, worth less than what's owed on it, they're, they're happy just to, to let it out of the estate. Very cool. So you're listening to Whistle Wednesdays here on KCBQ 1170. We've been talking a little bit about short sales here with Lawrence Mudgett and bankruptcies and all this fun stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the actual real estate side of a short sale when we get back from the break. You're listening to Whistle Wednesdays here on KCBQ.